Ben Hodges is a retired United States Army officer who became commander of the US Army Europe in November 2014 and held that position for three years until retiring from the US Army in January 2018. He was most recently a senior advisor to Human Rights First until the summer 2023 and serves as NATO senior mentor for logistics. Until recently, he was the Pershing Chair in Strategic Studies at the Center for European Policy Analysis, specializing in NATO, the transatlantic relationship and international security. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please do like and subscribe and definitely comment on the channel because comments are becoming increasingly important in YouTube's algorithm. Do also consider supporting the amazing Ukrainian charities. There are links to them in the description of the video. And if you like the work of the channel, do please support us by becoming a patron or buy me a coffee. Uh, ben, I'm delighted to welcome you back. I think this is the sixth time and hopefully this will be one of the most challenging of our conversations well you are certainly a glutton for punishment jonathan not at all it's it's as ever it is a huge uh privilege uh to be able to speak to you uh and uh, gain access to your expertise and insights and i guess we're going to be summarizing the year because Last year saw some incredible advancements on the battlefield um, that uh, even the propagandists couldn't spin. Taking back of Kherson, Kharkiv, big swathes of Ukrainian territory. This year, however, the story has turned um, and the press seems to be obsessed with narratives of stalemate uh, where Ukraine is covered at all. And actually the coverage is, is, is fairly thin, certainly in the US, but actually in, in Europe and, and the UK as well. Uh, that media focus tends to be on divisions and negativity. So what's your impression of the year? Well, obviously, I was uh, disappointed that um, Ukraine's counteroffensive did not achieve as much as we had all hoped, and frankly, as much as I had uh, predicted. Um, we, the West, failed. Ukraine didn't fail. We failed to deliver what uh, they were counting on in terms of uh, air power, long-range precision weapons, um, other things, capabilities that were needed for that counteroffensive to be successful. Um, so I'm that that's frustrating. There's no other way to describe it. It's very frustrating, and it probably has prolonged the, the war by at least a year. Having said that, and I'm, I'm very uh, glad that you have highlighted the fact that there is this uh, defeatist sort of narrative that out, that's out there, which to me is inexplicable. I mean, Russia first invaded Ukraine nine years ago. After nine years, with every possible advantage, Russia controls today only 17% of Ukraine. Um, they have lost well over 300,000 soldiers, uh, thousands of tanks and armored vehicles. The Russian Black Sea Fleet is having to withdraw from Sevastopol in Crimea. Uh, the Russian, the Great Russian Air Force um, has not yet achieved air superiority, nor has it been able to interdict the lines of communication bringing equipment ammunition from Ukraine uh, from Poland into Ukraine. Um, I don't think you could find 10 Russians who actually really want to join the Russian army and come to fight in Ukraine. So this uh, the narrative, I think, is all wrong. And by the way, you know, the Russian counteroffensive this fall has cost them over 20,000 dead Russian soldiers for the accomplishment of a few square kilometers uh, in the vicinity of Abdivka. So the only thing that gives plausibility to any sort of reason for optimism on the Russian side is the faltering by the U.S. Congress uh, and the apparent rapid willingness of so many uh, in the West to say, oh, Ukraine has to go negotiate. They can't possibly win. It's extraordinary, thing. isn't it? It's extraordinary that uh, presented with some extraordinary successes and gains and presented with uh, what has been characterized as a stalemate, the media invariably chooses the negative angle. <clears throat> and if you take the Avdivka offensive that you're talking about there, 
I think the figures are something or sort of two to three kilometers of uh, gains in terms of you know muddy muddy fields and devastated towns. There's there's really nothing to gain control of. It's it's utter First World War style devastation, and we've all seen those images of the extraordinary destruction of Russian hardware. Um, but also, it seems that they are losing artillery pieces now. From your military perspective, what's more important? Is it the high attrition rate of personnel or actually is the attrition rate of Russian artillery pieces, tanks, fighting vehicles, etc., a far more important metric to track? Uh, the artillery is, is um, more difficult to replace than are the uh, thousands of uh, Russian uh, losses from uh, conscripts that uh, the Kremlin continues to find out in the hinterlands. Uh, notably, none of them come from Moscow or St. Petersburg. Um, the way to neutralize Russia's only advantage, which is mass, is by taking out headquarters, artillery, and logistics. Because without those things, then the mass uh, infantry has no chance to, to really have, a, have an effect. So I think the Ukrainians recognize this, and that's why they have really focused attention on taking out Russian artillery. And we also saw the attack on the Black Sea Fleet headquarters. I think we talked about that in our previous conversation. I mean, that is an extraordinarily traumatic and symbolic, but also significant militarily. And just in the last couple of days, we've seen other attacks on Crimea, where I believe there are space-based communications, a huge facility that has both historic and strategic importance. That has been taken out by Storm Shadow. Um, if we could sort of look at the importance of that and Ukraine's ability to still strike at these huge strategic targets, but also if they were to have the long range attack that you've been talking about, if they were to have Taurus, what more over and above could they do uh, than with the, the relatively small number of storm shadow that they currently have? Well, all praise to uh, UK for providing storm shadow, however many um, have been provided the Ukrainians have proven the concept that with just a very small number of storm shadow, they can make the Crimean Peninsula untenable for Russian forces. You know, the first attack that you mentioned, you know, where they they uh, severely damaged the dry dock and destroyed a submarine and a ship that were sitting in the dry dock in Sevastopol. And then the two storm shadows that took out the headquarters. Um, that's what caused the commander of the Black Sea Fleet to realize they couldn't just sit there. And so about a third of the ships of the Black Sea Fleet have relocated to Novorossiysk, several hundred kilometers to the east in uh, a real Russian Navy base, a uh, Russian uh, port. So um, if, they, if the Ukrainians had uh, a tackle with its 300 kilometer range or the German Taurus, which is close to 500 kilometer range, and that same sort of precision, every single Russian headquarters, logistics site, facility, uh, artillery piece that's in Russian-occupied Ukraine would be in range. Not one of them would be safe from being hit. So um, air base like Saki, the big logistics hub at Jankoi in Crimea, uh, the rest of the Black Sea Fleet, all of these, they couldn't sit there. I mean, there's nowhere to hide um, if the Ukrainians had enough of these long-range weapons. And then you... Um, it's very difficult in modern times to hide a headquarters. I mean, you, the the uh, the signal that's generated from all the communications and the traffic coming and going, et cetera, et cetera, it's impossible to hide them. Every one of these would be hit. And, and so this would be such a significant increase in capability uh, for Ukraine if we provided those weapons. This seems to be where the West is regulating or dare I say even tying Ukraine's hands behind its back um we we discussed this I think a, a, a few interviews ago and this was whether Ukraine is coming under undue pressure uh, not only to limit uh, the amount of irregular warfare uh, that it is unleashing within Russian territory especially Belgorod um but also that we are essentially telling them, that they cannot hit Russian territory. They can only hit occupied territories. And of course, it then becomes easy for Russia to place 
part of their logistics, command and control, et cetera, beyond Ukraine's reach. Um, for many people who have internalized Russia's threats and internalized the idea that Russia is some, you know, invincible foe to be feared, um, let's let's do an analogy in the Second World War. This is this is akin to say the US saying to Britain, well, you know, you can hit occupied France, but don't you dare touch Berlin, etc. When you look at it in a deep historical context, aren't the limits we're placing on Ukraine absolutely absurd? I, I like the word that you used at the beginning of that question about uh, regulating Ukraine. That's exactly what's happening. And, and I don't understand it. I've heard some explanations, but I don't understand it um, by intentionally withholding certain capabilities that have such obvious advantage for helping Ukraine successfully defend its territory. Uh, and by taking so long on decisions such as F-16s, tanks, et cetera, um uh it is a a governor a regulator on ukraine's ability to do certain things and that can only be intentional uh when i've questioned people like how come we're not doing the providing the attackums you'll get three different answers none of which are related to each other and none of which are true uh, the, the CEO of Lockheed said he'd never even been asked if he could increase production of a tackle. So this this is about the United States and others regulating Ukraine's ability. Now, uh, the historical analogy that I have tried to um, think through, and, and maybe uh, you're a better historian than I am, but, you know, when you think of World War II lasting for six years from September 39 till August of 45, the first three years were constant disasters for the for the Allies. Uh, and thankfully, Great Britain was able to withstand uh, all of this, even as France and other countries fell away and until the United States finally got in the war. So the first three years, nothing but bad news until finally in uh, summer of 42, things begin to change. And it was still three more years after the U.S. Uh, enters the war and gets serious about industrial capacity and, and raises huge armies, navies, and air forces. So imagine if FDR had told Prime Minister Churchill, hey, come on, you know, there's no way you can win. Um, just hang in there, uh, but let's negotiate with Hitler and Mussolini and Emperor Hirohito um, to, you know, for the sake of peace. That's exactly, exactly what um, people are now pressing the Ukrainians to do for the sake of peace. Come on. And of course, it's ridiculous. And, and thank goodness, Roosevelt and Churchill understood that this was about democracies against uh, fascist autocracies. And I, I think that uh, and they still had three years to go. And this very much brings to mind, I think, Churchill's uh, rebuke to Chamberlain, which is, uh, you know, you 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 pursued honor to avoid war, and you know, he, you you will end up with no honor and war anyway. Or he he expressed it obviously far better than, than I have there. Oh, I'm, I'm um, familiar with that quote though. Um, but everyone focuses on Chamberlain and appeasement, but actually, Britain started to rearm in a really serious sense from 1934 onwards so a lot of this appeasement uh, behavior was actually perhaps covering up for systemic weakness and hiding this process of serious rearmament do you see and i think i know the answer to this unfortunately do you see any serious sense that the west is arming to counter the threat from Russia and potentially China and other countries in the axis of intolerance? Or have we got an extraordinary historic complacency that two years into this full-scale war, uh, we're still burying our heads in the sand? Uh, I would say in places like uh, Finland, Estonia, Poland, Romania, they are 100%. They, they're, they are not confused about what's going on. They're not confused about the threat. Uh, their head is not in the sand. They are doing everything they can, I think, as fast as they can. I was just reading this morning that 
Finland has already doubled its uh, artillery production, ammunition production since February last year, and they expect to triple it by next year. Uh, Germany um, is, um, contrary to its nature, um, is actually very active right now, trying to increase capabilities, but they're having to overcome decades of, of um, complacency, uh, of wishful thinking, uh, and, and it's going to take a while before they are mobilized in, in a way. But, you know, not too long or just a few days ago, we heard the chief of the German army talk about use a word that um, even for me was a new word called Kriegstuchtigkeit, which is basically war readiness, not just readiness, war readiness. And so you're hearing German officials talk more candidly about you know, this, the threat. And of course, they're worried that since the United States Unbelievably, we have the possibility that Trump could be the president again. I don't think it's going to happen, but he could be. And so Germans are like, holy moly, um, if that happens, you know, we, we're going to have to be able to do this without U.S. help. And, and I think this is very important that more and more Europeans are beginning to realize that if the United States fails, the threat doesn't go away. If, if anything, it becomes more real. Now, in my own country... Uh, we still, even with the largest defense budget in history, um, have not significantly um, increased our production of, of key weapons and, and ammunition. Um, we're still dicking around with some of these things. Um, and, and until we get serious about expanding capacity, we're, we're going to have a problem. We have quadrupled the amount of artillery ammunition production. That's great. But it's it's only up to about a week's worth of a Ukrainian requirement. And, and so we're not we're, we're not really fully serious yet. So this is an interesting point, the mismatch between what's required, well, even to survive, but for victory and what's actually being done, because it seems that many of the messages are kind of political to say, yes, yes, we're doing everything and so on. But the language has changed, hasn't it? And the, there seems to be a mindset behind the language. It's no longer just about uh, political shenanigans. There's an actual mindset which is holding back um aligning actions with a strategy. And we've gone for as long as it takes, which was weak enough to start with, unspecific enough. Now the language seems to be for as long as we can, which is a further dilution. Um, what in your view is the real challenge here? And why has this mindset of providing the minimum required to keep Ukraine in the fight rather than aligning ourselves with a clear concept of victory and, of course, delivering what's required to achieve that? Well, I think there is, uh, I, when I heard that, as long as we can, I just shook my head. It's like, what? Uh, you know, in, in one way, as long as we can, that's forever. Because if we're serious about it, the U.S. obviously does have the industrial potential uh, and the wealth to be able to do it. But we, it's the political will uh, that's missing. We, we seem to have lost our strategic backbone. Um, you know, the... Uh, Chinese are watching, and there's so many people that are, are say, don't, we don't want to waste time in Ukraine. That's local stuff. You know, we need to focus on China, the real threat. Well, the Chinese are absolutely watching to see, can we, the United States, with all of our allies, help Russia? Do we have the political will, uh, the industrial capacity and military capability to help Ukraine defeat Russia, help Israel destroy Hamas while still pushing Israel towards a two-state solution, um, prevent Iran from expanding this conflict, stop the Houthis from shooting at cargo ships in the Red Sea, um, and still have enough left in the tank to deter China. That's what they're waiting to see. And right now, I think they're thinking, doesn't look so good. Uh, and that raises the the risk of China making a terrible miscalculation. So that's, that's part of why it's so important that we rediscover our strategic backbone and help Ukraine win. And this is intrinsically tied to leadership, I think, as well, you know, having a clear concept of where you're going and then taking people with you. There's an interesting uh, quote, I think, from Colin Powell, uh, which is, you know, you're a leader when people follow you out of curiosity. And I didn't quite under 
stand that quote until I started to observe Zelensky's behavior, especially at the start of the war. He did things that people were not expecting. And through that force of leadership and, 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 and the clear-eyed understanding of the situation, he was able to carry people with him. Do you think the inverse is here, that many Western leaders are not doing things that are unexpected. They are not making leadership, bold leadership decisions that make people sit up and go, oh, hang on a second, that's not what I was expecting. They are doing exactly what Vladimir Putin expects. Um, and that is hedging their bets, being moderate in their language, fearing Russia, and being, unfortunately, predictable. Um, I, I, that's pretty pretty good description of, of where it is. I do think that we showed two years ago that we could do the unpredictable, that the Russians um, were sure that we would uh, look the other way or that we would not respond uh, to their uh, large-scale invasion because we had failed to respond after Georgia, after Syria, after the invasion of uh, Ukraine in 2014. Germany was still building Nord Stream 2. Uh, the U.S. we were uh, looked like a disaster after January 6, as well as the conclusion of the Afghan war. Um, NATO seemed in disarray a little bit, so they were pretty confident that they could uh, go ahead and finish the job in Ukraine uh, in very short order. Uh, and that's where we, we saw what happens when uh, when a leader. Uh, does take a stand and articulates why it's important. And I think President Biden, this was one of his finest moments, was when he and uh, British, German, French uh, leaders uh, and others from around the world said, no, this this is not acceptable and we are going to help Ukraine. But where they stumbled is, is, and fell back into the predictable, safer uh, way was to stop short of saying, it's in our interest that Ukraine wins and defeats Russia. I, what you said earlier, I think, is very true, that there are a lot of people who have, over the decades, internalized this notion that great Russia is somehow, um, you know, it's too big, it's too important. Academics and political people have invested their entire career on cultivating this and having their Russian rel uh, relationships. And, uh, you know, this this is... It may be the place of, of some great poets and uh, artists and uh, writers and musicians, but it's also the place that kills hundreds of thousands of innocent people. And until we can think about that with our eyes wide open and articulate that to our own people, why it's important to stop them, they are going to keep doing this. And whoever comes after Putin will keep doing this. And I think people do sense this dearth of leadership, and they 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 are seeking that. I think that's one of the frustrations of uh, modern politics, which, of course, Russia's been able to weaponize. It's been able to weaponize the partisan divisions. It's been able to convince people in certain quarters that... Uh, you know, their fellow citizens are the greater threat and enemy rather than external threats, which, which we know are greater. One of the interesting things in the comments is I know that around 30, 40 percent of the audience of this channel is actually U.S. based. Uh, and then there's lots of people in Sweden and so on. And out of those, I think the majority or a small major majority is probably Republican. But what is absolutely curious is when we look through the comments and we discard the trolls, because you do generate a lot of trolls, it has to be said, um, <laughs> because of your media profile. But when we look through it, you will get both... Uh, uh, I would say a sort of Republican and Democrat people saying, I wish Ben would run for president. I wish we'd have someone who could show clear determination and leadership. Now that's maybe a poison chalice that you would, you know, not in your worst nightmares want to consider, but it's interesting there that people uh, essentially don't look at you as that partisan figure. And that's perhaps what they're seeking. They're seeking someone who will transcend those party political divisions? Well, um, I think you have hit on the fact that people need leadership, all of us. I love it. Uh, when I, whenever I had a commander, a boss that would come in and, it's, you know, the worse the situation, the crappier the weather, whatever, the more important it was to have somebody come in and say, all right, guys, we're in a jam. This, this sucks. 
but here's what we got to do and here's how we're going to do it. And I'm sure, I'm sure we, man, that was like, okay, you know, you, you run through the wall for somebody like that, that is completely honest about the challenges and, uh, but also can articulate why it's important that, that element of leadership uh, and not talking about a cheerleader, you know, or uh, you don't have to be real loud, but people need to say like, all right. I mean, every sports team out there, whatever your country, whatever your sport, always has that one player that you turn to them and you know he or she's going to come through. And, and so you, so that that um, being able to clearly articulate what's what's happening and, and what's needed is important. And right now we're missing that in the West. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think most Germans actually would entirely support uh, doing a lot more for Ukraine. We see it in polls. Uh, and I hear it with all the different Germans with whom I interact from different parts of life. But the the Chancellor Schultz doesn't trust himself. I mean, he's a lifetime SPD. And of course, he has part of his party that would be totally against that. Uh, President Biden, um, decades of experience in foreign policy. Um, but he's in a very, very tough battle um, domestically for, for re-election. And um, we have become very vulnerable in the United States to disinformation. And uh, it's a very, very tough, tough uh, domestic mm. political scene right now. I mean, we're we're divided. It, it's hard to it's hard to see. And a decisive victory in Ukraine would have perhaps made some of those partisan issues a lot easier and less toxic. But what it also seems to have done is opened the door for the kind of warfare where Russia is actually rather successful, and that is grey zone tactics, uh, propaganda, disinformation, but also active measures. We've seen the truckers blockade uh, on the Polish-Slovak border very much, uh, although a lot of the media missed this, uh, very much associated with far-right, pro-Kremlin, um, almost certainly financed and uh, managed by GRU or whatever the, the, the organization is that would do that. Um, we see Viktor Orban being the Kremlin's useful idiot, uh, gumming up the EU and uh, preventing. So we see Russia actually being able to make significant progress in the gray zone. Um, how have we ceded this territory to them? And why do we not seem to realize the threat from so-called gray zone warfare? This, this is such an excellent question, and it is an area where we in capitalistic societies should be crushing uh, the other side in the information domain. I mean, we can convince uh, people to spend a lot of money on stuff they don't need, whether it's overpriced uh, sneakers, uh, clothes that you don't need. Uh, unbelievable. So our marketing skills uh, in the U.S. and U.K. and in Germany and other places is incredible. Why can't we use that same sort of marketing talent and, and, and reach inside Russia to um, help change the narrative? Or at least if you're not going to convince Russians, which is obviously extremely difficult uh, because of how the media there is controlled, make sure that the, everybody that lives around Russia is uh, inoculated against all the poison that comes out of out of Russia, uh, these uh, right-wing extremist organizations, but not only um, right-wing extremists in, in Europe and in the United States, uh, parrot Kremlin talking points. It's incredible. Um, and of course, when you start doing investigations, you realize this is money from the Kremlin going into these things that are supposedly in the U.S., in U.K., in Germany, et cetera. Um, but it would it it takes determination and and um, I'm not sure that our legal systems are set up to enable the most efficient use of co competition in the information uh, information space. But that that that's something that requires effort and especially the in democratic societies where you have transparency and journalists everywhere like we should. Uh, there's an extra burden of making sure you're always telling the truth. Whereas the Kremlin, of course, is unencumbered with any responsibility for telling the truth. 
Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting you point out marketeers. I mean, at least one marketeer is uh, countering the disinformation and that because marketing is my uh, my day job there. <laughs> I introduce people at parties to say, what do you do? And I say, well, I, uh, I convince people to buy stuff they don't need with money they don't have. Um, but at least... You proved my point. <laughs> yeah, it is. Very, very much so. Um, and to take the slightly more sinister uh, aspect of that, we still have many Western corporations operating in Russia. Uh, some of the largest multinational, especially consumer goods companies, working there. They found loopholes in the regime, or they've just basically you know, ignored those. And they still do that with impunity, and it doesn't affect their Western operations. We also have uh, high-tech industrial components making it into the Russian war machine. We have machine tools uh, from various uh, Central European countries, etc. Um, and there are many other examples of this, including loopholes in the uh, energy sanctions regime, uh, enforcement of uh, oil embargoes. We have a huge spike in German exports that went up via Central Asia, which essentially is bypassing the sanctions regime. So again, is this a failure of law or is this a failure of political will to properly enforce the full gamut of sanctions? Uh, I would say a little bit of we're not organized to be as effective as we could be, but it really is about political will. I, uh, th this is another area where we should be crushing uh, Russians and others who are our adversaries. Um, when you take the combined economic power of the, the free world, you know, I mean, the Europe, North America, uh, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and so on, the combined economic power, we should be able to completely shut down Russia's ability to uh, do anything that helps the war effort. Um, I'm not naive but we should be so much better where we are. And I spoke with a sanctions expert, a, a old friend of mine who's a retired ambassador with many, many years uh, working in the sanctions business, if you will. And he said, I asked him specifically about the oligarchs. I said, okay, probably can't really influence 100 million Russians, 140 million, what they think about things. But what about the 100 richest people in Russia around Putin how do you get to them? I mean, it doesn't seem to me seem to me that they are really experiencing any pain from all of this. I mean, they may not be able to get their yacht out of impoundment right now, or they can't go see their mistress down in Croatia. But whatever, um, that's it. Doesn't feel like we're having an effect. And he said, "Okay, so actually, the U.S. and others started going after these guys in the very beginning, and, and there are some things that are being done." But he said that they are very good. They, these oligarchs, are at hiding their money. I mean, shell companies, giving it to their kids, whatever. Uh, it's out there. And he says, uh, and of course, in the U.S., you have Department of State, Department of Treasury, and Department of Commerce. All three play a role um, in different aspects of this. I imagine U.K., France, Germany have similar mechanisms. Um but he says it is very, very time consuming, very tedious work to go through the eight levels of or eight layers of where the money's at, uh, including Putin himself. And so I thought, you know, I'm way out of my depth here, but there must be some applications for uh, artificial intelligence that can pursue things, or maybe it's quantum computing that can pursue things at a speed that a room full of accountants could not do. Uh, so that's a long, rambling, poorly constructed answer to your good question. I think we we don't have the will to really put our shoulder to the wheel there and do what needs to be done. And of course, one of the challenges, I mean, I was speaking to a lawyer in Kiev yesterday, um, and they said one of the interesting aspects of it is what you've described there is definitely true. You know, the wheels turn very slowly, um, there's a certain amount of inertia and bureaucracy built in, but once the West gets going, then, then things eventually happen. But what Russia is able to do is hire Western law firms, hire Western PR agents, and actually they use our own resources and talent and framework, a rule of law framework against us. Um, whereas they're operating in a complete absence of rule of law, 
it's it's an entirely different system. They are seizing Western assets of Western companies yeah, and giving them to warlords. Uh, they're not operating in any sense within rule of law. And yet we are checking our behavior and giving them the benefit of our rule of law system. That also has a significant uh, uh, impact here because there's the 300 billion of assets, uh, Russian central bank assets, which we have not yet touched or redistributed to Ukraine. Um, again, often citing rule of law arguments, uh, which I would say perhaps shouldn't apply to Russia. Um, I'm not sure what your view is or how important those funds could be to help Ukraine towards victory. I think, uh, first of all, there's no doubt that that money should be taken uh, and utilized to help fund Ukrainian uh, procurement, uh, training, ammunition, all the stuff that they need. That's a lot of money. And uh, and also to help pay for Ukraine's reconstruction once this is all over. So to me, that seems entirely appropriate. I'm, I'm from Florida. The state routinely uh, seizes uh, assets of drug runners, for example, these you know very expensive boats, uh, houses, et cetera. And then the proceeds are used to pay for countering the drug the drug war. So uh, on a much smaller scale, obviously. Um, I think part of our problem also is that when you shine a really bright light on all these goings on, um, we're going to find American companies, uh, British companies, others that are dirty, uh, that are buying, shipping, handling Russian oil and gas, for example, or that companies and subcontractors are providing parts, as you alluded to earlier, that are helping the Russian war effort. And so uh, there is, um, you know, we are not clean. We are absolutely not clean in all this. And this money invested, now, one aspect of the funding for Ukraine, which is not getting enough attention, is that actually 90% of the money allocated to support Ukraine ends up getting uh, spent in, in the US. Uh, and that could be a very important statistic. However, it is also widely known that the US military industrial complex, and probably that applies to, to, to other countries as well, is rather efficient and has something of a history of large amounts of money uh, not necessarily going on, uh, you know, being spent in the best fashion, but also uh, even when it is spent, the cost of, say, one five, uh, five millimeter shells, et cetera, is, is, is extraordinarily high when you look at the individual unit cost. What Ukraine has shown it's able to do is innovate in a far more agile fashion and actually produce things like drones and munitions and they've even got their own production line of MRAPs apparently now, uh, extraordinary uh, ability to tool up. Antonov is retooling its uh, um, you know, aerospace works to produce drones. They're aiming to produce a million next year. The unit cost of producing these munitions in Ukraine is far, far lower than the equivalent Western uh, complexes. So again, these funds, if we were able to actually empower Ukraine to arm themselves, could this be one of the solutions to the bottleneck well i, I certainly expect so um you know the uh, ammunition production is a is a good um example to follow we're not talking about high technology here to make a artillery ammunition uh but you do have it does require thousands of employees uh and it does require certain materials uh, which are not unlimited. So the price is going up because now everybody is scrambling to get into the ammo business uh, and you've got limited amounts of uh, the, the explosive, for example. Um, so it, it, boil, it does boil down to political will, putting money into it, and then companies will add another line, add another shift, do what we used to do this quite a bit. Um, I don't know the answer for the materials, the, the supply chain, um, but, you know, um, you cited Churchill earlier and, and one of my favorite Churchill quotes, and I know a lot is attributed to him. Maybe he didn't say all of it, but, um, supposedly, uh, at the beginning of the war, he said, gentlemen, we are out of money. It is time to start thinking. And so, uh, you know, the Ukrainians are certainly in that case. I mean, that they're being forced into, uh, innovation and doing things. 
that would not form, follow the normal sheet, bureaucratic procedures, uh, et cetera. And uh, I, I think that we should be looking for ways to support that, to, to um, uh, encourage that, and, and hopefully we're learning from it as well. I'm going to turn to an area which is very much in your wheelhouse, and this is the wargaming that took place, the modelling that took place prior to Ukraine's counteroffensive, because we know that great disappointment has been expressed by a number of um, uh, military experts in the media. The media itself seems to have really oversteered uh, in the direction of despair now, after being oh, perhaps overly optimistic. But it seems in a recent Washington Post article that really dove into this um, that they questioned many of the assumptions and inputs that went into the war gaming that may have contributed to the misalignment of you know, supplies uh, and misplaced expectation. One of those would seem to be perhaps to overestimate the uh, capability of uh, Ukraine military in things like combined arms. Um, the other one is to underestimate Russia's capability at defensive warfare and the kind of deep minefields it constructed and what it would take to get through those. I don't know if you read that and what your view on the failings, perhaps, of the war game process is. And perhaps there's an over-reliance on computer inputs, computer simulated input, as opposed to human intelligence. So uh, I am indeed a big supporter and fan of war gaming, um, both uh, computer assisted simulations, as well as, you know, traditional kind of analog paper, big maps, etc. Uh, but of course, these do not generate the solution to your problem. They help you work through aspects of the problem. Okay, if we did this, how long would it take? If we tried it this way, how could you speed it up? What do we estimate casualties to be? Etc. Um, of course, these war games, uh, I think there were eight that were conducted uh, at different levels, uh, would have all been classified. So I, I don't I don't have insight into everything that was discussed. But usually a war game goes wrong if uh, the assumptions are wrong. I mean, obviously, wrong assumptions will generate uh, flawed uh, outcomes um, or um, if they are. In, incomplete. I mean, you don't touch the, the full range of, of, of things. Clearly, these were good, smart people, both from the Allies as well as Ukrainian side that would have been involved in something like this. But how, how could you come up with the idea that we can launch a big attack against these Russian defenses without any air power? Not insufficient, zero, uh, or without providing them adequate engineering capability? or factoring in how we gave the Russians basically six months to uh, to put in their defenses, which they did not waste. How, um, what what did we what did those war games tell us about that? So that's um, I don't want to comment any more on that because I don't know enough about it, but those are the kind of things that come to mind. And of course there are uh, you know there are, we've seen, to very much be focusing on um, uh, the known knowns and the known unknowns, uh, I think I read someone say, but what we seem to have failed to do is to really focus on the unknown unknowns, to quote that uh, infamous, um, you know, uh, Donald, Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> um, but in this case, it seems to be very opposite because um, we did not sufficiently model the sheer quantity of mines, but also there's rather more unexpected behaviors that came from Russia, and that was the uh, destruction of the Kohovka Dam. Now, there is still, I think, unfortunately, some debate about how intentional it was. But I was speaking to a um, a Swedish uh, trainer, military trainer, who's been in Ukraine. Um, and I don't know how sensitive this information is. I mean, it seems that it's not because this is a historic event now. He says that a significant number of vehicles and artillery pieces were repositioned to the southern front from the Kohovka region prior to the destruction of the dam. Uh, and in his view, the destruction of the dam was extremely strategic because it thwarted uh, uh, one aspect 
of uh, the counteroffensive that had been planned and allowed Russians to redeploy a significant number of hardware to protect uh, the area where they thought the main thrust of the attack would come. So, again, is there a failure of, of us to predict how brutal the Russians are are capable of being in service of their strategic objectives. Yeah, this this is uh, the cla a classic example of how we still just can't imagine that they would blow up a dam and that would cause so much environmental damage. Like, well, there's no way they would do that. Okay, um, just like, come on, there's there's no way they would launch missiles against civilian targets. Right. Um, and and so I think that try and, and of course it's easy for me to be critical now uh, when I have no responsibility because um, I also am on record many times as having said I don't believe they'd use a nuclear weapon but it won't be for moral reasons it'll be for practical reasons so trying to understand how your enemy thinks is is always uh, going to be a challenge. Um, did we did we come away from those war games having our biases affirmed or did we not change our thinking despite what we were seeing from the war games because of our built-in biases that that will always be a challenge and so making sure you've got trusted people that are in the process that will say those things that are very uncomfortable i mean that i I imagine they did have that. I don't know. Staying on uncomfortable territory, um, Russia also seems uh, in this gray zone warfare to be very adept at weaponizing refugees um, in a variety of different scenarios. We also see a refugee crisis ostensibly driving the political impasse in the US. But what we don't see is a discussion of the gangs and behaviors and support that comes behind those. We know that Russia is weaponizing that through Belarus, uh, and in Finland, it's fairly obvious that that's happening. When it comes to the US southern border, uh, there are some studies starting to be done to suggest that um, potentially China uh, and, and other malign players may be playing a role. For instance, in the um, using people smuggling and refugees to get certain illegal substances uh, across the border. Russia is certainly doing that extensively uh, within within Europe. Um, and one of those would be uh, pre precursor components for fentanyl, um, which are uh, uh, potentially manufactured in China and then smuggled through the border. But there's almost like a a double hit there because then that refugee issue becomes a political hot potato and as we see is being used to block aid to ukraine so what should we be doing again about these techniques of those who would wish ill to the us and nato um weaponizing issues like refugees well i think it it requires us to uh number one build and maintain uh very, very strong relationships, not only militarily, but also economically, uh, intelligence sharing um, with <clears throat> all the countries with whom we have these common interests and, and recognize common threats. So that's that's job one. And the pre my president has focused on that since the day he became president. So that's that's important. But it also requires, I think, a strategic view of the world. You know, the Hamas attack on Israel, that was that was not a coincidence that 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 did in one day what Putin could not do in two years, which was make the world forget about Ukraine. I don't think that was a coincidence. Russia's number one ally is Iran. And Hamas, the Houthis, Hezbollah would not do anything without Iranian approval and enablement. Um, I think that the uh, the migrant flows that you're talking about and the pressure that's putting on our border and what it's doing to internal U.S. domestic uh, politics causing people to distrust the government and each other. Um, I don't think these are disconnected. I 100% agree with, with your supposition that um, this is being funded in part or what's a natural disaster is being reinforced or uh, ex exacerbated by Russian and Chinese uh, money. So um, looking strategically at the world, 
and purposely connecting all of these things that are happening and, and thinking, how do we do that? I mean, if you eliminate Russia as a threat to Ukraine, Iran loses their biggest ally. They become much more vulnerable. China gets a message like, okay, wow, the West, you know, they're up for it. So um, all of these things, I think if we think, if I am confident, if we think strategically, then we do have the political will and we build up the industrial capacity. And also, you know, we strengthen our societies. I mean, that's such an important part of countering every one of these threats you've identified. And I think the uh, we've we've got time maybe for one last question. And again, this is this is a difficult one. I went to a um, a lecture recently or a discussion that was given by um, one of Russia's leading uh, political um, philosophers and analysts. Uh, he is, of course, on the Russian sanctions list. Uh, he won't be able to go back there in time soon. And he painted a very disturbing picture, one that suggests we are still normalizing Russia, despite its horrific, brutal acts in Ukraine. We are still viewing it uh, as a society that is not totally beyond the pale. But he described the emergence of an ideology amongst Russia's elite. This may be expedient. It may be just a way for them to utilize the population. Nonetheless, he called it national Bolshevism which is a horrific hybrid between Nazism and uh, Bolshevik communism. Um, and as the Russian government um, uses more and more of its population as a simple resource to be wasted, and as it takes over more and more of the economy, and as the sort of criminal infrastructure fuses further with the state, uh, you know, with the uh, policies of the state, what we're seeing here is historically perhaps a a mafia um a nazi mafia state emerge to put a, a very clear label on it um are we taking this threat seriously enough and are we perhaps in a kind of 1930s moment here without us fully realizing it no we're not um and when i listen to people in the administration and others talking about russia they clearly you know, have this romantic notion that somehow we can get along and still do, you know, Olympic sports with them and have cultural exchanges. It's absolutely wrongheaded. And, and we're making big, big strategic mistakes by failing to realize that we should not be afraid of the collapse of the Putin regime. Uh, all those terrible things you just talked about. Uh, that's all the more reason why we should help Ukraine defeat Ukraine, defeat them. And then uh, I think what follows potentially is a breakup of the Russian Federation, because I think probably half the people there don't want to be part of the empire anymore. That's an absolutely clear statement, Ben. Thank you so much yet again uh, for sharing what have become increasingly clear statements on all of these issues. I hope sincerely people will listen to this and it will affect some kind of change. Thank you for being so generous uh, with your time on this channel and, of course, the many, many other media appearances that you do. It's extraordinarily generous and extraordinarily important. Thank you very much for the privilege, Jonathan.